All right, series of Selena's Outcast, your host, John Livia, and I got a great, great guest with me tonight, John Elite. How you doing, John? Good, John. I haven't seen you in a while since Florida, actually. That's that's right. So uh, me and John kind of sort of know each other. He was gracious enough when I first started my channel to have me on his old channel that he used to do with Michael Dowd uh, to promote my channel. And uh, I'm very grateful for that. I flew down to Florida, and we actually had uh, dinner together afterwards. Yeah, we uh, did that show with the Berman Groups, the law office, the law office, and then we had dinner after that, yeah. That's right. That's right. Do you remember, you told me this crazy story. You left names out, but you told me this crazy story. It's a good thing that I was drinking at that dinner, because you told me this crazy story about somebody that you had to deal with um, outside of his home, and he didn't die because a, a neighbor came out. Do yeah. you remember that story? Do you want to yeah. touch on touch on that story or no? Yeah, I mean, they spoke about this. Uh, you know what's funny is a lot of people question different stories from different people, including mine. And I try to be very, um, uh, you know, specific in, you know, what happened, where it happened. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I said with the story was it was snowing really bad that day. That I re- Yeah, I remember and, you telling me that, uh, yeah. And, you know, I'm a young guy, and I didn't understand that if you shoot somebody, stab somebody, if they're laying in the snow, it'll save them because the blood, uh, the ice in, uh, from the snow stops the bleeding, which ah. slows down the heart tremendously and stops the bleeding, which, and, you know, in that period, I didn't know that. And how but, old were you uh, during this time? Uh, so it's got to be in the mid-80s up, I guess, anywhere from 85 to 88, something like that. Okay. And uh, I stopped at a club called Protocols where I had um, recently shot somebody there, actually, also in the chest. Uh, his name was Mike Levigny. So to be specific for the people that don't, you know, like them, we leave names out. Mm-hmm. Um and I stopped there to get a gun from uh, Larry Cucarelli and his brothers and Don. They used to run some drugs out of there also, uh, which, you know, I would give them the uh, weight on the drugs. Uh, stopped there, got some guns from them and uh, stopped at my other friend's house and got his Corvette. Uh, that's uh, Keith Pellegrino. At the time, he worked for me in the drug business and uh, took his car, took his Corvette, and uh, I had a guy, Joey D. Corrali, that was driving for me. Uh, and we we blocked the plate of the car with uh, with um, a rag. And we tucked it in. So after I do the shooting, I'm waiting for the guy to show up. And it's in front of the conduit and uh, down the block from Gotti Sr.'s mother's house on a conduit. Uh, a guy named Eddie Earl also sold drugs for me, drove a limousine and worked for uh, uh, Richie uh, Logan, who owned Logan Bones Company on Atlantic Avenue. And uh, Eddie was setting them up, bringing them there for me. And when they got out of the car, uh, for whatever reason, the guy was paranoid. He knew I was looking for him. And I opened up fire on him. I started shooting him. And he fell. I ran out of bullets, and I was going up to him to finish it with a knife and one of the neighbors came out who happened to be, I didn't know at the time it was a sanitation worker and he was yelling and I pointed the gun at him and he didn't know the gun was empty. And I told him, mind your business, go in the house, which eventually goes in the house. But then all the neighbors lights came on and uh, we took off. We got in the car. Now the next day I didn't know somebody got a partial plate supposedly, but the Corvette I had at that time was a, a weird color. It was between a maroon and a brown, and there wasn't that many cars that looked like that. And um, the police went to the owner of the car's house, Keats, and he himself told me he gave me up. He said, you know, 1988, I believe that was when he gave me up, actually. And he told the police uh, that I had his Corvette. But the and crazy part him. of the story was the guy that the guy lived. I remember you telling me the guy actually lived. The guy lived because of the snow. And the guy's name was Paul for the people that uh curious who it is. Is he still alive today? Yeah, he's alive. And years wow. later, I, I ran into him again years later. And um, for a long time, I wanted to finish it, kill him. Um, I didn't. 
his father was a first grade detective. And uh, after the shooting, I, I took off. Um, and I wasn't sure if he was going to talk or not. And I wanted somebody to speak to the father. So the father knew in those days, he knew Joseph Carrazzo, who later on becomes a concierge. He knew Ronnie Warnham, uh, but they were scared to speak to him because he was a cop. Mm. So they told me that the guy was threatening to uh, give me up. So I left. I was in Puerto Rico. And I came back from Puerto Rico myself, and I knocked on his door. And when he opened the door, the father opened the door. And then I threatened the father, threatened that I would finish it. Wow. And uh, the father said, we're not talking. We don't want no problem. And uh, I should have told the father what it was about, and I didn't. Uh, but uh, I let that go. If the father would have known, I think he would have killed himself, his son himself. But uh, moving on from that shooting, you know, I was the guys that went with me. Um, and the one guy that uh, gave me the car, you know, was still hanging around. And it's funny the way these people talk because – a lot of these guys became informants years ago and they're still hanging around the mob guys. So when people talk about exposing rats and children nonsense, talk the way they talk. Uh, I can run through active mob guys that are actually made right now and guys that are uh, involved with them over the years. They're all cooperators and informants. And it's, that's why I talk against the life the way I do against guys that talk. You know, because most of these guys, uh, John, you know, we, we've had these discussions. They're not, you know, they come on these shows and they say they're hit men and they say they, and they never really did anything. And that's why none of them will talk kind of the way I speak very nonchalant about it because I'm against the life. And uh, I try to show, you know, the truthfulness behind, you know, really, you know, who was the guy doing this kind of stuff like me. It was very rare that we see these other guys doing anything. They just, I don't know, they're almost like play acting like they're doing a television show. Yeah, there was a, a great movie, I don't know if you ever saw it, called 25th Hour with Ed Norton, where he works for the Russian mafia. And uh, he has a meeting with one of the Russian bosses, and he says to him, you carry a gun, but it's like a toy to you. It's a prop. You don't actually use it. Yeah. I, don't know if you, I don't know if you remember that scene. but I so, like Ed Norton. I like this show. Oh, he's great. So, I mean, pretty much everybody knows your, your story. But just in case there is somebody that doesn't out there, maybe somebody that's new to my channel or new to introducing you, why don't you just give me a summary of your early life and how you got involved in organized crime? You don't have to spend much time on it because I got plenty of other questions that we can get to. But just so you know, uh, people know exactly who you are, even though ninety eight percent of the people will already do. <laughs> I'm Albanian for the people who know. I got the shirt on. I'm a big patriot for uh, Albania, for Trump, the American flag for this country. And uh, I started as a young kid. My father grew up in Delancey Rivington Street. Uh, he grew up with uh, Lucky Luciano's first cousin, Charlie Luciano, they're called Blackie, made guy in the Gambino family. Him and my father were his partners. They had a three-card Monty game in the Bronx. And so I've been around wise guys like him since I'm three years old, four years old. Another guy, Al Greco, who uh, just came home from prison. Did, I don't know how many, it's 30, 40 years. So these guys were... Uh, huge, you know, icons in the mob back in the day, not in these days. I'm um, going back when I was a kid. So you're talking about, you know, 50 something years ago. Uh, so I grew up around all of them. Fat Andy Ruggiano was the boss in our neighborhood. His son, Albert, was my baseball coach. So I just was born into the life. Um, I was born into the life. And uh, I think we blacked out for a second. Um, I, I was born into the life, and my girlfriend as a kid, her uh, dad and uncle were wise guys with the Casey family. So it was just the way I grew up. I was around it since a child. And then later on, I got involved in a higher level in my own doings of things I was doing. So Now, from, from what I understand, I actually have a friend. <clears throat> I don't know if you remember me telling you this. I have a friend that grew up in the same neighborhood as you. Uh, what was the neighborhood? Were you in Howard Beach or... Woodhaven. 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 Okay. Who? Yeah. Uh, his name is Ernie. He's Spanish, but he grew up in the same neighbor neighborhood as you. He's probably a little bit younger than you. And I remember telling him I was going on your show when you had the show with Michael Dowd. And he goes, uh, he says to me, "You going on his show? That that guy used to run the whole neighborhood when I was a kid." So 
ex- explain how you got to the point where you were not Italian, you were Albanian blood, but you got to the point where you had as much respect as basically a mob boss. You had your own crew, you had your own uh, rackets going on. Explain how that came about. Well, you know, when you got people, you know, you'll get people say, well, he wasn't a made guy. He didn't know people. He didn't. Was, these are people that don't understand their life. They're ridiculous. How I got to that point is violence. And, you know, violence is, you know, when you're violent, everybody's respects you. Everybody's afraid of you and doors open for you. Plus, I was also a moneymaker. So I had two things in my favor. I wasn't dumb. I was kind of educated uh, with school on the street. Uh, I made a lot of alliances outside of the Italian mafia. I had friends that were, uh, one of the guys was the president of Hells Angels as a kid. Uh, I knew later on in life, a lot of pagans, uh, different groups, the Kings, uh, black groups, the the Bloods, guys uh, from the Bloods were friends of mine because of where I grew up on East New York, Jamaica Avenue. And I did business with different groups, whether it's Spanish, black. Um, I got involved with cartel guys through a girl who was dating as a kid. So I had uh, a little bit of a different reach than the average street guy did. And, and I moved around a lot, I had a lot of houses. So I didn't live just in Woodhaven. Later on, I moved to Jersey, South Jersey. So I knew the Philly guys. I knew the Jersey guys. I knew the New York guys. Later on, Florida, California. And then I went international. So, um, you know, the money brings a lot of different people into your life. And the violence keeps everybody in check in your life because they knew you were capable without asking somebody else to do the work. Um, guys would ask me, can you help me and do the work? So uh, guys would offer me money to do work or they'd offer me their drug business or something. You know, it's just open to you because I was, you know, violent. And at the same time as you're violent, you're getting, you know, when people think, you know, I tell young kids this all the time, you may be dangerous when you're young, but people aren't going to want to fight you anymore when they hear that. They're going to look to kill you. They're not going to look to hurt you because they know you're going to come back after and that's kind of what happened to me. You know, the guys started stabbing me and shooting me too or shooting at me. And, uh, you know, I've been through a lot on the other end. I, got, I took a lot of beatings and got stabbed up a couple of different occasions, batted and, and shot. And that's mm-hmm. going to happen if you're going to be in that position is you're going to put yourself out there where uh, you're making a lot of enemies besides making a lot of friends. So, Now, at the, at the height of your <clears throat> underground life, how many guys did you have in your crew and what kind of illegitimate and legitimate businesses did you have? Well, I owned, uh, over the years, I owned three nightclubs and after hours, <clears throat> excuse me, two glass shops. I had uh, parking companies in 16 States. Wow. I owned a candy store. I owned an after hours. Um, I was in the bookmaking business big. I had about 150, 160 customers for, I don't know how many years, probably 30 years. Um, bought all kinds of real estate, bought 16 homes and buildings, commercial buildings. And so, uh, you know, I made millions and, uh, brought a lot of guys around me that made millions. I had probably about 15 to 20 close friends around me. Well, I say that loosely, who I thought were my close friends. Uh, when things started happening, uh, for the people who don't know, my friends, when I was in Brazil in the penitentiaries, my so-called friends and mob friends and mob bosses, they were cozying up to the FBI. They were having meetings with them. They were talking to them. They were making deals with them. And I was rotting away in a penitentiary in Brazil. So my friendships, uh, I never got caught with a glass of water. And so when people throw that word out, you know, loosely, he's a rat, that guy's a rat. You know, I, I take it with a grain of salt now because I really don't care about that, you know, but that's farthest from the truth. I was never caught with anything. Right, 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 right. It was always, you know, it's unfortunate that uh, that was, as far as I'm concerned, uh, that was the the demise of the lifestyle as everybody was cooperating and pointing fingers and so on and so forth. And then you get guys sitting in jail for God knows how long going, well, if everybody else is cooperating, what am I doing sitting here rotting in jail, you know? Well, you know, I would accept the fact if you get caught with you or anybody else doing something, you get caught, you go caught, you got to go to jail. I mean, I spent almost 20 years in prison time. So when people ask that question, I didn't do one or two years. I was sitting in a penitentiary, in an international penitentiary, one of the worst ever in Brazil. It's a concentration camp for three years. While I was sitting there, I was betrayed. 
betrayed right. by several families, crime families, betrayed by their bosses, by captains and their families, made guys, and then also the associates. So right. uh, either you, you make the decision you want to be a sucker for these guys or uh, are you going to fire back? And uh, I decided to fire back, but I was right. never caught. That's you know the thing people don't understand is I was just caught by rats, by guys that they call rats. Or, you know, guys that are informing or informants or whatever words you want to use. I, I, you know, to me, I don't use those words. I don't really like using those words, but that's the words they use. So, you know, right, I, right, right, right. Let's go back to when you were at your height. Um, you must have had a lot of good times. There must have been celebrities you met, beautiful women, uh, experiences you probably would have never had if you if you weren't in that life. Um, because you know Hollywood glamorizes a lot. Is there any truth to to that? And uh, if you could speak to it on a personal level, yeah, I mean that's the lore of uh, you know that life. You know, as, as a kid, right? You're making all kinds of money. You're, you're naive. I went to Rocky Lee restaurant one time with this older woman I was dating, beautiful woman. I'm sitting at a table, and I'm with Diane Carroll and her husband Victor Mall. Now I knew who Diane Carroll was because of the TV series, and I used to watch it. And Janet Jackson was in it. And Victor Moan's sitting and he's having a whole conversation with me and he gets up and there's like a buffet at Rocky Lee. It was a high, you know, it was, it was very popular. Frank Sinatra used to have his birthday party there every year. And it was his birthday party, actually. He didn't show up at the, on this occasion. But it was, and Victor Moan's talking to me. I had no clue who he was. Really? And That's... he says, you want me to get you? And I said, yeah, can you get me this, this, and this? And the woman kicks me. And she's like 10 years older than me. And she's involved with a lot of wealthy people. And she said, you dummy, you know, joke and laugh. And she goes, that's Vic Damone. And I'm like, who's Vic Damone? <laughs> so when he comes back, he starts asking me about the music I listened to. And I named, you know, everybody my dad listened. I said, obviously, Frank Sinatra. I listened to Dean Martin. I'm, I'm naming different people, Jackie Wilson. And uh, he said, uh, do you ever hear of Vic Damone? <laughs> and I, was, yeah, I heard the name, but I never listened to any of his music. And he's laughing. He goes, I'm Vic Damone. And I says, yeah, I just heard that after you got me my plate. <laughs> so he started, but he was a very nice guy, very humble, nice guy. Right. I was talking about Engelbert Humperdinck and some people I met. So I met Engelbert Humperdinck and I, and I met, I used to date uh, Connie Stevens' daughter at one time. And uh, so we went about 50 of us on a cruise. So yeah, some of the things you're saying, James Conrad from uh, the uh, show Wild Wild West or Whatever I think that was what it was called. Uh, um, I mean, you know, I just met all kinds of people. So uh, Steven Seagal and mm -hmm. uh, you know different actors over the years that are in your company. And you know, listen, you're a little bit impressed. Honestly, I was never that guy. The only person I ever really wanted to meet, and over the years was probably besides Bob, like Bobby Mercer. I met was great, great, nice guy. Uh, I spoke to his son a couple of years back about it. What, what a nice guy Bobby was when he played for the Yankees and uh, I, I wanted to meet Donald Trump. And uh, so I was impressed uh, and meeting him several times and uh, being over at Mar Largo, things like, you know, that impresses me. Sure. Because of the intelligence, because of the power, because of uh, obviously he was the president and uh, because of the patriotism of this country and I'm a big patriot. So um, that uh, was something oh. unique. Oh, I can only imagine what it's like meeting Donald Trump. The closest I ever got to that was meeting Muhammad Ali. <laughs> yeah, it's, my dad knew Muhammad Ali, actually. Really? Yeah. yeah. So I, I work with a lot of younger guys now. There's a lot of young guys that come in, even guys at the gym that I know that are younger. Um, and they, they uh, you're a few years older than me. Um, I'm Gen X. You're, you're a boomer. And, you know, they don't know the movies, uh, Goodfellas. They don't know Casino. They've never watched them because they're young guys. And, you know, movies aren't uh, what it, they used to be, where everybody would go to the movies and see the latest De Niro movie or whatever. Because I would use them, I would use those as a reference. And one of the things that I would try to explain was that back then, even when you were married, everybody had a girlfriend. Yeah. And and they 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 almost can't fathom that. Like, really? You're not faithful? Because the, the the young guys growing up today are completely different, right? And and I would use like the the movie Goodfellas or even Raging Bull as a as an example. Like, yeah, everybody had a girl. You know, if you didn't have a girlfriend, you will look like as as a mutt. You were like there was something wrong with you, right? Especially growing up in those neighborhoods. 
I mean, you know, my father had a girlfriend until the day he died. Nobody knew about right until he died. Uh, but can you speak about that? Like it would uh, the girls and and how everybody has gumadas and and so on and so forth. Well, it's part of the lifestyle, like you said. You know, raging bull, Jake Lamada used to have dinner with us all the time. Really? So, uh, yeah, Anthony Quinn from Zorba. So, you know, wow. we had dinner with him. Um, and, you know, some of these guys were, you know, this was part of the life. You know, it was part of that limelight life. We all, you know, we're out on the street. It's part of the street life because you're not home. So, you know, Friday night would be with your girlfriend, Saturday would be with your wife. And, uh, you know, you talk about some of these movies, Goodfellas, Frankie Burke. The Robert Dinner plays Jimmy Burke. His son was one of my best friends. And really? so, you know, I talk about him in some of the you know interviews I do. And so to other people, it's movies to me, like uh Joe Pesci plays uh Thomas Thomas uh De Simone. His That's wife right. Cookie grew up with me. So it's really? you know, and later on she married my friend Robert Angles. And so, you know, when other people are watching, it's the movies for them, and for us it was that reality. And it's you know, it's very odd to tell this generation of guys that are involved compared to the guys back when we were involved. Because when we were involved, there was a lot of serious consequences. There was killings like crazy, uh, shootings like crazy, and that doesn't occur now. So you've got these, you know, big mouths, trolls on computers. Guys wouldn't have never did that back in those days because they know if they were to troll or if they did that and you, you find out who it is, you know, you're going to hurt them real bad, shoot them or kill them. Right. And these days, that doesn't happen. These guys are almost glorified white collar criminals that say that they're gangsters. Um, it's just it's just a different era, and there's no way to really explain it. Besides, you know, because when people hear stories like this, I wanted to go. And the reason why I don't, I, there's a reason, one reason I want to do it, I want to go through each shooting I was involved in and do a series on them. Because I want the younger guys and people to understand, it. you know, it's like because I'm very against it these days, and show like, okay, listen, I'm going to go through each story very specific, like I just did with you, but I'm going to continue to about 35, 40 shootings, and then I'll be very specific so people all know it's genuine, it's mm -hmm. legitimate, it's not bullshit like a lot of these guys are coming on shows telling you they're hitman or they're this or that whatever stupid story they come up with. But I'm very specific about abusing certain guys because they glorify guys like Sammy Gravon. And I look at him as a bullshit artist old man. And they say artist guys talking about a guy that was on the bus. And I laugh because it's not, I don't care what position he had, what title he had, because everybody can have a title as a CEO of any company, restaurant, because somebody's family member got him in or through a connection. It right. doesn't mean when he was younger, he did what he's going to be able to walk you through what I'm going to walk you through. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't have much respect for, for him because of the message he, he gives. And I know he's lying three quarters of the time. And people will say, well, how do you know? Because you were only this and he was that. And uh, the only way they're going to understand that is I keep going through stories. So I can slowly explain. It's like teaching somebody in school how to speak Spanish when they don't know how. It's step by step so they understand it. Right, right, right. We're going to get to Sammy. I definitely want to talk about Sammy and a couple of other guys. What you said, uh, you pretty much hit the nail on the head, which pretty much made you relatively uh, f social media famous. Because um, when you were on Valuetainment with uh, Patrick and David, which is the first time I ever was introduced to you when I watched, because I'm a big fan of that, of his channel. Um, yeah, you were talking about things that you did, but the specifics, you know, and, and the famous phrase was, yes, I did. Right. And, but the specifics, and I remember, I remember watching this going and, uh, and I was talking to a friend of mine at work. I was like, dude, you don't even have to like, listen to me. Just look at him. You know, this guy is, was a serious gangster at one point. Right. Cause I mean, you just had it written on you the way you, handled yourself and so on and so forth. But though those interviews between Valuetainment and Vlad TV, they kind of gave you a huge uh, kickstart, if you will, becoming social media famous, if, if you will. Like you basically utilized it. Now you had your own one show and now you have another show with Gene. Um, discuss how that affected your life. 
Well, I went into social media not to glorify the life. I was trying to show people that listen to what I'm saying, the life's bullshit, and I'm trying to be very specific on what I did so they understand. Hey, this guy really is who he is, not these guys with titles. Mm -hmm. And to try to listen to me, not them, because I'm trying to bring a point across that there's nothing about loyalty, all that fancy, you know, gleam and all that stuff that you hear about with the actors and actresses and the money. It's short lived and it's a life of misery. And these these other guys that claim with these titles, they're fakers. So when I get like, I don't know if you've seen this, this is Life magazine. Really? And I was a cover of Life magazine in Germany. Now, I take the opportunity with what I did in a negative back in the past, and I try to make it something positive now. And I try to stare kids away from this and do something in the right direction. I took something very negative and I brought it into a genre that if anybody looks back, nobody was in this genre but me. They were afraid to come in this genre. They were scared that there'd be consequences of their actions. So slowly, I started bringing everybody in this genre. There was nobody but me doing the mob genre. Now, there's tons of people doing it mm -hmm. because they think it's safe. And pretty much, I would say it is safe because, you know, the mob today is not what it was. And they live off the yesteryear. You know, they, they these guys aren't what we were doing back then. They don't know what it is to be, you know, shot in the head like some of my friends that I stay with today that are still alive. Uh, yeah. My friend Cookie and... Uh, or somebody uh, like, uh, you know, somebody let's talk on the other level on a different, because I grew up with a lot of black guys. I had Snow Billy on my, sh on my show and had Six Nines manager for the people that, uh, you know, listen to that music and rap. And uh, Six Nine was shot in the head and he lived. And then I got friends of mine, one after another, that never lived there, shot and mm -hmm. killed. So I try to show both sides. And then I also try to show uh, the expectancy of living a good life. And being on the street is is very rare. There's not too many guys that live, and there's not too many guys that don't end up like me in jail for 20, 30, 40 years of life. And then the, the aspect of betrayal, everybody's going to betray you like they did to me. And then from being nowhere to the top, I went right back to the bottom, and I reinvented myself in this. Right. And I just try to be as honest as possible when I stay in this. And then you're going to get the haters. They're going to attack you. It's part of social media. Mm -hmm. because insecurities on their end, I guess. You mentioned um, you mentioned prison and, and how long you did. What was the straw that brought the, broke the camel's back? How did you finally, how did they finally get you? Uh, again, mob guys giving me up. They said they, they found me on the internet, which was not a true story. It's a lie. Uh, because I had six or seven different people on internets sending messages from different countries as if they were me once a week. And then they would send the message to my family once a month from those countries. So uh, there was already a plan with my dad in place where when I wanted to get in touch with him, I'd leave him a message through somebody else to go to phone booth number one, 18, I had 20 phone booths. So he'd go from one to 20, depending on the number, and I'd give that person a time to tell him to be there. So I used that phone booth once, and I wouldn't use it again for another 20 weeks. So every week he'd get a phone call from me and uh, decide. But I made some outside phone calls to mob guys that were made guys. And uh, a couple of them, or one of them specifically, gave the uh, United States Marshals uh, my location at that phone booth that I only used once. Wow. I happened to be on that corner, and they must have been laying on that phone booth. and. Uh, I was on that corner for not to use a phone for a, another reason. And uh, they surrounded me with the army. And uh, I was on uh, America's Most Wanted. I was on uh, Interpol's really? Most Wanted. And I was when they got me, I was on Associated Press. And Interpol did a, it's a famous video that's out with them parading me through uh, cameras of probably 20 countries in an office where they're trying to question me and force me to to say certain things. And I said, I don't even know why I'm here. Right. And they told me at that time, you're charged with multiple murders and Rico. And uh, I went back to my cell. I obviously, I hire a ton of lawyers in the United States for family members of mine that were brought in also. And the uh, lawyers in Brazil, international lawyers, investigators. And I spent millions on lawyers to find out that uh, not a dozen, not two dozen, not three dozen, not four dozen, 
but over five dozen guys uh, from two families, uh, mainly the Bonanno family and the Gambino family were all giving me up and wow. saying I was the killer. I was the violent guy. I was the street boss. I was uh, a guy that was a loose cannon and a rogue and they couldn't control me. So there was all kinds of statements. And uh, Now, who was, who was, the, who was the, the boss that you had to kick up to or, or somebody that you were close with that uh, when any one of them, did they turn against you? The whole regime of bosses turned against me. So it wasn't really? long until, uh, you know, the whole Bonanno family fell. And even when they fell, Joe Messina was the boss at Water Water against Vinnie Gorgeous. But when Frankie Coper, captain in the, in the uh, Bonanno family, was cooperating, he happened to be in prison with me. And he went out and said he was going out for the hospital for an eye retina exam because he had problems. And I told a couple of guys that were with me from the Gambino family. One of them was sharp. The other guy was a dummy. <laughs> and I said, uh, you could go blind and I'll let you out of here. This guy's cooperating. So when I got out, I met with Joe Messina uh, behind his house. And uh, he sat in a chair. I went down over a couple fences in the backyard through uh, a good friend of his that brought me in around with Joe Newman. And uh, we talked about certain guys he was looking to straighten out. And, and I gave him the information. He said he wasn't concerned at the time that Frankie Copa had nothing on him which he didn't directly. He had it on his brother-in-law, Salvatale, who was the underboss. And, uh, by, you know, one at a time, they all started flipping on each other and Joe wore the wire. And, you know, so the whole, all of them started giving up information. And, and then my family, everybody was talking and uh, all the bosses, all the captains, and it's all on 302s and it's on the record. And, you know, when I was in the pen, there was all kinds of newspaper and radio uh, programs with all the bosses, right? And, and they had a trial in Florida where uh, Captain Ronnie Warnham was known to be my partner earlier in life, did an opening statement saying, uh, Johnny A. Let's a killer, a rogue, a loose cannon. If I'm not nice to him, he'll kill me like everybody else. And he blamed all the drugs uh, on me and the Gotti family. So, you know, these are, you know, I tell people when they, you know, some people that don't know what's going on or, or they write stupid comments. And I'm saying, well, I didn't make that statement in open quote, Ronnie Warnham did. I didn't make this other statement, Mikey Scar's captain in the Gambino family. He spoke about me on, on a constant basis. And I don't got no hard feelings against any of these guys anymore. You know, when people say, you know, there's guys that cooperate against me, I talk to them. I got no, I got no qualms with them anymore. I got a different life. I get it. It was being naive, believing that people are gonna, they're not gonna rat. Well, if that's the case. Uh, for the people on your show that don't know, Albert Anastasia gave up Lepke when they killed Reels off. The, they threw him off the hotel. That was his That's best right. friend. Yeah. Right. So he was a rat. And, and I, you know, and I can give you modern day names, but Lucky Luciano also at 16 got caught in a heroin trade and he ratted. His excuse was I was only a kid then. And then I could go into all the bosses over the years that became rats and informants and guys like Joe Messina and uh, Ralph Natale in Philly and Leonetti in Philly. We can go state to state. And so who's buying this nonsense? This ain't the Godfather, this ain't right. the Bronx tale. The, the, the reality is people talk. And when they, they, they're in a corner and they're trapped, they do what they did to me. The only difference what they did to me is I was already in the pen. I'm the guy that's supposed to be ratting on them, and I didn't do that. I mm -hmm. held my mud. I helped guys try to beat their cases while I was facing double life, uh, the death penalty. And uh, guys were all meeting Govan, cozying up to the FBI. It wasn't me cozying up to anybody. Right. I stood in those pens. And uh, when people were turning on me, when I got back to the United States and I seen the repertoire of uh, family members on all sides that were giving me up, and then I made a, a, a decision. Am I going to be in a sucker for these guys? Because when it's convenient, he's uh, the killer. When he's convenient, he's not a made guy. When it's convenient, he's a junkie which anybody right. who knows, knows or your friend knows it's not true. Right. And, uh, you know, at first I used to get mad when I first got into this. And then I learned to be a little more uh, re relaxed, a little more passive and understand that, you know, you can't stop everybody from talking nonsense. Right. You know, they watch good fellas. None of those guys were made guys. So people don't, don't know. That's you right. Know, That's right. Jimmy yeah. Burke wasn't Tommy DeSimone wasn't none of them. When, who is the, uh, who is the boss that, uh, that you 
would kick up to or or ran the crew that you were with when you were in uh, at the height? Well, you know, I started off with the, with the Lucchese family as a young guy. Then as I got older, I went over to the Gambino family. And uh, John Gotti, the father, was the uh, boss. And, you know, he would say I'm with the regime. So I was with their family, you know, and that's who I answered to. I listen, I, like I tell most people, even when I tell you, you know, there's a million videos out with me at the Raven. I, I don't know if you've seen them or not, or in front of Gotti's house, and they're all over. But you know, you don't do what I did for a living and still sit in here if it's not okay by the boss. Right. I'd be dead. I'd be and, and not a not a good death. They would chop you up. You know, so. How did you wind up in a Brazilian prison? Uh, I went on a run. I was in uh I don't know, 20 something countries. I name them all the time. When people ask me, I'll name them for you if you want. But no, don't worry about it. <laughs> so I went from Cuba to Africa to Brazil and I picked up five passports. I had a couple of shitty ones too. So I had about eight passports in total. And uh, so I, I went on the different names. I traveled from country to country. And eventually I went to Brazil because I had a connection there. It was one of the countries I had a connection in. And I had a connection in Africa. That's how I got the passports. And then, and then they caught me in, in Brazil eventually. And what was the difference between being in a Brazilian prison as opposed to coming back to the States and being in an American prison? Well, you know, American prisons, you know, there's a lot of lockdowns and things like that. Brazilian prison, you with 58 guys in a 12-man cell. You're uh, shitting in, on a floor in a hole. You know, there's uh, It rains inside. You're naked most of the time. You're eating rice and beans. Twice a day at your meal, unless you can get to a guard and bribe them. Um, if you see most of the guys, they look like concentration camp victims. You have uh, mosquitoes like the plague, like a jungle. Um, and rats that are huge, like unbelievable. So the conditions of food and humanitarian conditions are incredibly awful. You know, it's nothing like United States jails. Right. And the killing there was crazy. Weapons, machetes, guns inside the prison. Now, when you got back to the American prisons, did you have any problems in prison as with either other mob guys or um, uh, other guys from, you know, whoever, the Aryan Nation, Bloods, Crips, whatever? Nah, I was friends. I mean, I've been in and out of jail my whole life, friends with everybody. Right. So, you know, when I decided to talk, actually, the disciples out of Chicago, one of the bosses was a friend of mine. He's the one who kept convincing me, you're crazy. This guy's all ratting on you. You know, F them. He says, you know, what are you stupid? What are you, what are you, who are you trying to protect? They threw you under the bus. They're coming through here, marching through every day, giving, going into uh, grand juries, ratting you out. He says, fuck them. And, you know, he, and the guys like him got in my head right away. And I started saying, you know what? I'm done here. You're right. These guys were all giving me up. I never got caught. So right. eventually, but I had Latin King, the guy who revenge that was a friend of mine from East New York. He was one of the bosses there. So, you know, when I was on these compounds, I didn't want to get locked down. I didn't care. I was very open. Guys were behind me on it. You know, guys from uh, Dirty White Boys, they were all friends of mine. They all stuck up for me. Everybody knew what was going on. So it wasn't like the guys in jail were against me. They were for me. Um, you know, unlike what people don't tell crazy stories, but anybody that was in those jails, and there's plenty that write in, that were in those prisons with me, knew I was very aggressive, got into a lot of fights in jail. Not over that, just jailhouse stuff. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they used to put my chair right in front for the TV. I got good treatment in jail. Yeah. So that you had you had a lot of respect, obviously, because your reputation preceded you. Well, you know, guys, get to, you know, guys will talk nonsense, but they know when you're out there violent and you're killing guys and you're shooting guys, you're stabbing up guys. Then unless they're really serious and they don't and they don't want to go home, they're not going to step to you because they know what you're capable of. Right. And, right, you right. know, if they don't want to take it to that level. And if it doesn't involve them directly, why would they? You know, and I'm, you know, there's a lot of tough guys in jail, but if it's not their business, they stay out of it. That's jail. Okay. Now, when you finally got out of jail, how many years did you serve? 16, 18? 18. 18. A little more than 18. You know, totally. Wow. Should have been more than that by the way you calculate. Like when I did the Brazilian time, I was supposed to get eight and a half years credit. They didn't give it to me because of the conditions. So, you know, if you're going to fight that, and then besides at the time, I was in and out prior to that. Then this case, they gave me 12, I did 10 on it. So, um, so when you were well, in, when you were in prison, 
I'm assuming the feds confiscated everything. Because earlier you said you had uh, legitimate businesses, you had uh, real estate, you had uh, plenty of money, uh, offshore, onshore, um, jewelry, I'm sure, homes. When you got out of prison, did you have anything left? Or they confiscated everything? Zero, Zero. gone. Everything. Really? I had a Rolex, diamond Rolex on in, in Brazil. And uh, they came with like, they come in with military police. They called me over to the gates. And, you know, and, and first off, if you have a regular watch, they'll chop your arm off in the street or in jail. There. So it'll show you the connections you got to have to have it on. If I had a $100,000 bezel Rolex, it's in a lot of pictures. People see it. Mm -hmm. And one of my cousins that was ratting on me, Billy Queso, gave me a picture of me with that Rolex on. So they came to the, the gates. I don't know what they were coming for. I thought they were handing more indictments because there's too many guards there and the military police. And they said, uh, take that Rolex off. <laughs> and I started the, you know, I laughed with disgust. And I said, you know, I'm an idiot. I should have got rid of this right away. Yeah. You know, it's when, you know, because you can get paid visits, you know, even though they're illegal, but and I should have sent that watch out. But it's just another thing. It was only, you know, at this so, point, you don't need to look at it, just left. So when you get out of prison and you have nothing because they they confiscate everything, including the jewelry on your body, um, how did you adjust? I mean, was there any temptation to go back to that life? You, you're so depressed. You you, you want to get out of jail, right? And when you do get out, reality hits you. You have a couple hundred dollars in your pocket. You have no call. You got no way to get around. I knock on the door at my mother's house at two in the morning. They didn't expect. They didn't know I was getting out. And uh, she had a walk-in closet. They had enough room. They didn't have enough room. They took the doors off the walk-in closet. We put a cot in there, and they wow. removed the clothes that were in there. And that's where I stayed at first. So and how how old were you at this time? I just got out. I was like uh, fifty years old. Wow. And wow. and uh, you know, coming from being raised in poverty, to becoming very wealthy, to losing all my businesses, you know, just so you understand my, my uh, parking company, they sold it. The guy that was involved and ended up confiscating, they testified in, in six different grand jury hearings against me, and then they didn't use him at trial, he lied so much. But they let him keep my, because he was a witness, keep my company, sold him 17.6 million. My nightclub was making three to four million a year for 10 years. And wow. another guy kept that. And now the, all my trials are about these are my businesses. And I'm putting money and funnel money through these businesses to open up these businesses with illegal money. And that's the basis of their, their, their case against me. So that mm -hmm. obviously they know everything's mine. But yet they gave it to their witnesses against me. Right. Uh, besides my properties, besides they sent 800000 to a guy in Brazil who he kept in and also gave my paperwork in to the prosecutors here in the United States trying to get me to death penalty. So I wouldn't go after him for the 800 and something thousand he stole, uh, besides a couple of million in lawyers and investigators and attorneys in Brazil. And so, you know, on and on the money goes. And so I came home to zero and I had to reinvent myself. And uh, that's the hardest thing. Where, you know, just to get a car. How do you get a car? You don't have two cents. Right. And then some. People gave me a couple of breaks to work from, legitimate jobs. One, I was driving around the guy with a limousine and just personally drove him around and uh, made about 1000 1500 a week for a while. And then I got involved with another guy that met me through a friend of mine, and he owned about 120 uh, condo and townhouses. And that was a good stepping stone for me because what I started doing was collecting his rents and uh, going to houses of people and asking for you know, people that weren't paying without having to do anything, you just got to show up. They know it's you. <laughs> yeah. and, you know, it was in the area where everybody knew me. So, uh, and then when they moved out, I would, you know, oversee the moving crew, make sure they didn't steal anything. And so I was getting paid a couple of thousand a week there. And slowly I got back in a little on construction and I started getting on construction jobs with guys that were scared to go on a job without anybody backing them. So I started showing up so guys wouldn't shake them down and the coalition wouldn't bother them. So I had connections with, the, like I said, with the black community. So I would make deals with them if they wanted five workers or 15 workers. Right, kind right. Of so yeah. I was around on job sites after that. And slowly I brought myself up and got involved in different companies. And uh, 
got involved in this line of work and business and started doing movie shows, TV shows. And, you know, at this point, I've been, you know, sent up the GQ to cover Life magazine, Living Mel Well magazine, every country I've done magazines in basically at this point. Now, when you first got out and you were first working, like driving that, whoever that was around and, you know, uh, working in construction, was there ever a part of you that was like so bitter? Like, I can't believe I'm doing this right now, coming from the heights that you came from, going through prison, and then like, now I have to work like an honest guy. You know, in one way, I liked it because I knew I was making that money the right way. Another way, ego, and you got to keep the ego in check. Because if you stayed with me every day, John, you're, you know, you're a wrestler, you're a tough guy, you're a nice guy, gentleman, right? But you get such fucking idiots that challenge you every day. Mm-hmm. You know, because they know or they think they know you and they think that you'll never be who you used to be. So, you know, but your DNA is never going to change. Just like your DNA is never going to change. The difference now is I check my ego. So, you know, when my ego says, go kill him. Yeah, that thought process is still in my head. Mm-hmm. We'll go get him first. We'll go hurt him first. But like I tell people every day to talk to me, how do you do this? Because I get a lot of people now, kids and adults that ask for advice. And I said, well, the first thing that comes to your head, uh, let it go out of your head and don't don't make a move. Second thing that goes to your head, don't make a move. The third thing is more reasonable because you're thinking logical after it. Just mm-hmm. don't be impulsive because I used to be very impulsive. So when you learn that, and then you learn, just get through today and worry about tomorrow, tomorrow, like they teach you in alcoholic. You know, it's it's one day at a time. Forever. And it's still right. going to be that way for me. It's like one day at a time. That's never going to change. You just got to get through the day and worry about tomorrow, tomorrow. And I, that's the only advice I can give other people. That is you know? that is amazing. I never really thought of it that way, that it's it's just like being an addict where you have to check yourself and get through the day and tomorrow's another day and so on and so forth. You did an interview, which I thought was phenomenal. For me, I watched several interviews of you, but I thought this one was the best one. It was on uh, Soft White on the Belly. Yeah. And the reason why I loved it so much is because you you talked about something that was so honest that nobody ever asked you. And you talked about uh, PTSD and you talked about anxiety and you talked about the lack of sleep that you get. Uh, can you talk about that? And does that, does that still haunt you till this day? You know, a lot of things haunt me, you know, and I, and I'm very open about it. You know, and I think people like, listen, there's so many guys I want to hurt. I, and that's being honest. There's so many guys I'd like to kill. And that's being honest. It's just that I control myself not to kill them. And I control myself not to hurt them. And I know, and I tell kids this all the time, they're talking. If you want to hurt that guy or kill that guy, you might as well just kill yourself. Because that's what's going to happen. You're going to hurt yourself. You're going to ruin your life. So either you can make that choice and and deal with it psychologically. And that means, you know, you, you go to the gym, you're a gym guy. Mm. I go to the gym more for my mind than I do for my body. And so and I, I give that advice to anybody in jail or out of jail. Work out, to work out, work off that anger, work out that anxiety. And then it's not just physical working out, it's mental. That means read, go to church, because I became an avid person in church and faith. And I also see a therapist. And I'm very honest, I'll sit in that room some days and you're very depressed. And you, you know, you may cry. And you know, I was just watching an interview when they talked about Trump, and they asked Trump this uh Greg Kelly did. And he said, I don't like to publicly. I mean, we all have ways of mourning and, and you know, you're upset and what you do privately and how you but I'm pretty open, I tell people, because people that have PTSD know this. You're gonna struggle, you're not gonna sleep, you're gonna have some depression, you're gonna have some crying bouts, and you know, you're human. So if you don't and if you're not honest, you're going to lie to yourself and you're going to help all the people say, hey, I ain't the only one that's told you. So look, he said it. The difference is I'll say it and hopefully people will repeat what I say and they won't be embarrassed to say it because every day people struggle. The number one the number one thing in this country is mental illness. And I'm not talking about psychotic mental illness. I'm talking about people who are depressed. There's Absolutely. all kinds of people on depression that is that's true. I don't take it. I don't take mm-hmm. medication for depression. I, I try to deal with it in different ways, reading, positive work. So when people think, oh, this guy's full of shit. I've heard this a lot. You're helping kids are full of shit. I'm doing it just as much for myself that I am as for them. 
and because it helps me to, to feel better about what I've done in the past, what I do today. So it's not just about helping them like, you know, I'm trying to be this, oh, I help kids, great God. And I tell kids that when I see them, when I talk to them in groups and schools and prisons, I've done everything. At this point. Um, and I'm honest with you. You guys are helping me as much as I'm helping you by having these talks. Oh, okay. No, I, I fully uh, agree. And I understand on a small level. I don't obviously understand at your level. Um, but yeah, uh, the gym is as much mental as it is uh, physical. Because I go there more so now for the mental part. Like if I have a yeah. strenuous day or something's going on, it definitely, definitely helps. Are you able to sleep through the night now? Because during that interview, you said you were able to get like maybe 20 minutes in a, a night. I do the same thing. I put on a movie and I watch it for maybe a half hour and I fall asleep. But an hour, I only have later. I'm up. Now, do you still Mostly have? Quick. Do you still have uh, flashes of uh, the people you've hurt from the past? Or yeah. Whatnot? That never I, goes I don't away. think that. I don't think that'll ever go away. But at the same time, I have the same trouble when someone talks stupid to me. It says, "Oh, I want to fight you." Or, You're right. Where I want to, I want to do something bad to him, and I just really train myself. And listen, his days where I don't, I'm angry for two or three days at somebody. Mm. I won't react like I used to, but it hurt. It's not easy to deal with because, right. again, it's, you know, to me, it's your ego saying to yourself, do they realize I'm not them, I'm not faking this, that they're faking it? But right. then you say to yourself, what am I, an idiot? I overcame everything. I got a good life again. Um, and then, you you know, you get a hold of yourself. I, I, can only, I can only imagine the trolls that you get because I get trolls and my channel is you know a third the size of yours and I, and I mean one time I just made fun of myself and I did one video just talking about the terrible comments I had under my video you know and one well, the funniest one was this guy sucks somebody just wrote this guy sucks <laughs> you know and it, yeah you get it but I, I, well, John, you, it's tenfold well, here's the thing I know you right but say right. I didn't know you and I put you on and I didn't like what you say right I just turned it off I wouldn't Get up in the morning and start writing against you. Right. I went on. So you got to take it from the source of the guys that are saying it. What kind of men, what kind of kids, what kind of, that's why I really feel bad for children and that get bullied because adults are doing it. And if adults are doing it, how about that poor kid that's getting it at school that can't get away from it? So, you know, they go to school, they're getting bullied, they come home, they're on computers bullying them, they're on that's right. cell phones bullying them. So you, you really, it, it's a terrible situation, but when you step back and you think about what kind of loser, like I told a guy one time, you know, and he just, this is recently too. I says, are you married, buddy? I, and, you know, can I curse on you? Absolutely. So he says, are you married, buddy? I says, are you having trouble fucking your wife? Or is she fucking somebody <laughs> else? Because I don't get what the fuck you're wasting your time with me for. I yeah. says, maybe you hate my gut, so fucking what? What makes you come on here writing me like this? It's yeah. not, there's mentally something wrong with them. Yeah. Because- I, I, I couldn't agree because it's like, if I don't like a channel, if I don't like a, a television show, I just change the fucking channel. I go to a different yeah, one. Right. That's well, it. Who does that? yeah. There's a lot of guys I don't like, but I'm honest about it. you. you know, I mean, I'm talking about guys I don't like. If they're in this life or they're a boxer or they're a wrestler or they're a weightlifter, I say I can't stand this Jericho, but he's good. You know, I'll say the truth. Oh yeah, these absolutely. guys are personally something wrong with them when they try to attack something that's a lie. Like if that, if you don't like something, it's okay to say I don't like him. It's okay to say you don't think he's a funny comedian. But when you go after him and you get up in the morning or at night and you're writing on him and you, it's something mentally off with them. It, oh, yeah. it, something's missing in their world. For absolutely. Them to do. It's like they're bitter, angry, and that's the only way they could kind of take it out. And it's it's because they know there's no repercussion. You know, it's yeah. unbe- it's un- unbelievable. Well, Since a lot of people I- tell me, oh, you're full of shit. I'm like, all right, say I'm full of shit. I just, but I talk so, like, direct. Yeah. The way I just gave a couple stories. So, you know, I tell people, like, when they tell me I'm full of shit about, they've done this to me on other shows. And I told the guy, I'm going to name me by address all my properties that I had. I'll name all my clubs I had, the locations I had, you know, because how do you shut them up? So that if you're very specific, then now that where they're going to go with it next. Right. Plus know, it's so. public knowledge, by, yeah. by the way. I mean, you know, you could literally look it up, but anyway, let's, uh, I want to uh, turn, since we're on a high note, I'm going to turn it a little bit. Um, when you were on uh, Valuetainment, 
you were talking about Sammy Cravano and you kind of spoke to him, uh, spoke about him with respect, but that kind of changed in the last few years. Uh, what, what, what had happened uh, between well, you two? Sammy, when he was in jail, I didn't know Sammy good. You know, I never said I knew him good. Okay. But I'm going to tell people that are watching this now. He is the number one fucking liar. Bullshit artist. So he does a video. Somebody goes on his YouTube and he does a short saying, him and Frankie Loke have no idea who I am. But now, after you lie like that, go on my tapes on the Raven night, and I'm in front with Sammy Gravano back in 84 and 85 and 86. So, you know, if you're going to fucking lie, at least make it a good lie. Now, his crew of guys that stayed with him, one of them are one of my best friends, but he ain't in his genre. So when a jerk off lies, he's in jail, and he lies and says Frankie Loke liked him, Lucasio, so you know. Frank Ocasio couldn't stand him. He put him there for life. I was helping Frank Ocasio get an appeal to try to come back home. Not him. He tells everybody it was him. And the lawyer that was representing Frank Ocasio, somebody can look up who the lawyer is. I don't want to say his name out here in public. Mm -hmm. And contact him and ask him, was I helping get Frank Ocasio? So he just lied about a lot of things. And when he was in jail, he asked me for lawyers. I got him lawyers. He reached out to one of my friends and they started getting in touch with me. He was hounding me. And then I did some talks with his daughter. Who I, I like his daughter. I got nothing at all to say negative. It's her father, and I feel bad that I'm talking against the father because we were friends. But he had a reputation of screwing everybody in his path. I didn't know him like that. I wasn't personal. Bro. Even his personal story, I really didn't know. I spoke highly of him, and I said he was this, he was said that, and I told people I shouldn't have said it. I misspoke. I thought he was a decent guy. I thought he had balls. I thought, and then I started finding out more and more and digging into him. The more he opened his big mouth. And then I lent him $3,000. And then he lied. He said he, he took the $3,000 to say all these good things about him. And I said to him, this is a guy with no integrity, no spine to even if, even if that was true, you're going to get up there for an hour and do a whole video on me and just talk about this guy was a killer. This guy was a moneymaker. This guy's an Albanian mafioso. This guy saying it for $3,000. What kind of hook are you? <laughs> yeah, so right, I said right. to him, you know, so you can't have it both ways. Like no one could give me three thousand dollars to be a jerk off clown, make it, right. and that's what he's trying to say that he was just a jerk off clown. So what, no matter what he says, he lies, just like he said about Gotti, you know. And I and I actually stuck up for him. And then I started going into his case, and then I went to a, my lawyer, who was his lawyer, and I got into more into his background. And then he said he wanted to kill Gotti. Well, why didn't you kill him? He was in jail. You weren't killing Gotti. You were petrified of him. You know, and I've said this, you carried umbrellas from God he didn't treat you like an underboss. He treated you like uh, Kamala Harris was. And I always say this as a VP to Joe Biden, you just fit the role for because he needed you for political reasons. Right. Not right, because right. of anything else. You didn't set up the Castellano murder. That's a fucking lie. You weren't friends with God like that. He was going to put his life in your hands. Mm -hmm. He's a ridiculous statement. Nobody questions. There so, was a you know, rumor I, speaking. I don't mean to cut you off. I apologize, but there was a rumor floating around. Uh, Jeff Nadu actually had it on his TikTok. I had watched it uh, this afternoon. There's a rumor floating around about Sammy Gravano speaking of the Castellano murder that he has the menu of uh, the menu that they served on December of 1985 in Spark Steakhouse hanging in his office. Have you heard that rumor before? You know because he's still. You know, reminiscing of the of that supposed uh, murder that he uh, quoted. Well, him. I gotta say two things. First, yeah, I heard that, and second, Jeff Nadu is one of those guys, Jericho. So he's lucky, and he, I did change my life because him. He's one guy <laughs> that I like to put my baseball bat over his head. I don't like this guy at all. Really? He's like, yeah, he's an arrogant little bitch. He just recently did a, a, a an interview with Zef uh, Mustafa, and for people's knowledge, he idiot uses my name to, for, for views. He tries to get cute the way he talks. He puts something up when I was cursing him out. But uh, Zep Mustafa and me were on in the New York Times years ago as the two Albanians that were around John Gotti and Frankie Lucasio mm -hmm. as they kept Albanian mobsters around. So, you know, when a guy like him talks, that's why I don't like guys like him because mm -hmm. they conveniently, you know, they're like fake news. They conveniently say certain things only and they leave out the truth. So he put a picture of me and Zepho. And, you know, he just tried to take a shot at me again. So do I, I, I really don't like this kid. He's just mm -hmm. a, a fucking clown that doesn't know shit about the mob. He goes and tries to read something or talk to somebody, he gets bad information, and then he puts it up. But anyway, uh, as far as Sammy, he's got no life. 
This is what happens when a guy at his age, 80 years old, whatever he is, that's washed up, hiding somewhere. And, you know, for him, it's almost like movie-like. He didn't set up the Castellano murder. That's a bullshit story completely. He didn't drive past that murder because it was Christmas time and there's a dead body in the middle of the street. He wouldn't even be able to get past that. With police and everything else is ridiculous. He wasn't nowhere near going to shoot nobody. I know who the shooters were. I talked about this already a hundred times. And, you know, nobody's contesting what he's saying because he was the underboss, he claims. But he knew John for a year or so. He didn't have nothing to do with setting that murder up. He's a fucking liar. And, you know, there's nobody questioning it. And at the time, he wasn't underboss. He was just a made guy. So the people who don't know that. So... He also said he's going to make T-shirts up with the people that he killed and uh, sell them. He First off, he never killed anybody but one person. And he killed really? a young kid that was 50. Yes. Check it, because I want somebody to just to fact check that. In his own words, he only shot one person and killed him, and that was in the 70s. He never. So when people tell me, oh, but he was the underboss. Well, he didn't get there by shooting people, just so they know. That's not how he got there, because he didn't shoot shit. So they could check, they could check that. And he, they said that he was involved in 19, 19 yeah, different murders. Yeah. Yeah. You know how he's involved in it? I'll give you an example. Weiss was killed years ago and a, a hundred guys got convicted of it. And that is you, me asking you to ask somebody else, say somebody else, say somebody else to do that. Yet. Yes. That's a conspiracy to kill, to commit murder. If somebody implicates that you were part of one of those conversations, if he could tell you where he was at some of these shootings, like the Louis de Bono murder he tries to talk about, he's a fucking liar. He has no idea what's involved in that because we changed the hit team twice. He started calling me a liar. It's part of one of my, my murder conspiracies that I was charged with. So he's full of shit. He has nothing to do with that murder. He didn't even know who was involved in that murder. He left people out. He didn't even know a couple of guys who were involved in it. This is the problem. The guy's a liar. So wow. when, when he talks about this stuff, if somebody asks him, Sammy, tell us how many people you killed. Specific questions, just the way we just walked through the shootings I just did. And that was just a couple. You've heard of other ones where I'm specifically talking. That's why I said I might do show after show about stuff like this. Because mm -hmm. I can talk about, like I said, probably 40, 50 incidents where I, I'm there, not where I'm not there. And I've ordered hit, hits also from jail. I ordered murders from jail too. So when he talks about, you know, well, you know, it's the same thing to set him up. No, it ain't. It's nowhere near the same thing that, that, that be on those in some capacity. It's wow. easy to be in another room with someone shooting somebody in the head. Big deal. So, you know, when he's talking, I want to know what he specifically did. He never talks about that. He leaves that out. Instead, he tells stories about, oh, I talked to Tony Salerno. No one gives a fuck about Tony Salerno or anybody else. He throw a bullshit name out. They're good at that. That's why they're con men. That's why they're frauds. That's why I tell kids, don't get involved with these guys. And if you're as tough as you say, you wouldn't be hiding. Like I always say the same thing. You wouldn't have went in the Witsack. You wouldn't be hiding somewhere. You wouldn't have ratted out a million guys. You wouldn't have gave up guys while you were in Witsack. He gave up even a guy, Jimmy the General, said he was going to hit the marshals. He got the guy fucked, poor bastard, got all extra time, and they sent them to a, to the hole for a while. This is this is the part that no one knows about the guy. And then he asked recently to ask to make up with me. And, you know, when he asked Gene, would Johnny make up with him? And I said this to him, go fuck yourself. Really? Guys like you were never going to change. You know, there's the story, right, of uh, the cobra, right? When You know the story with the snake. And later on, the snake, after he brings him across the river, bring, the turtle brings him across the river. Oh, and, yeah. Mine was the uh, frog and the scorpion was the one. Yeah, same, same thing. thing. Yeah, right, right, yeah. right, right. And he bites him and he kills him. And they go, why'd you kill me? Well, you knew I was a scorpion. You knew I was a snake. Right, so right, right, right. There is no reason to make up with the guy. He's got a history of being a snake. Wow. You know? If you ask him, did you take the 3000 Because he said it on his own show. Yeah, I borrowed 3000 Well, you ask him, why don't you give it back? He's not even embarrassed. I, I keep saying, and people say, you're obsessed with him. No, I'm not. I'm just going to continue to abuse him. I'm not obsessed with him. The guy's a fucking clown. Yeah, you know, you're not going to be jealous of his clothes because he dresses like a fucking clown. You're not <laughs> jealous of He's an old man. He doesn't have a social life. He is not out there, you know, jet-setting like me all over Europe and partying around and on yachts and cars and, you know, businesses and girls. So what, what are you jealous of the guy? So when someone says something stupid like that, I'm like, I got no reason. The only thing I'm exposing him because 
he fucked me. So now I'm going to keep, you know, talking about him the way I do because mm-hmm. I'm not lying about it. I'm giving facts. People can check. When he didn't get where he's at in a position because he has people that, you know, with the trolls, they'll write or it's him writing or he's getting people for him to write. And, uh, yeah, they've been writing on my show about my content lately. So I know it's him also because it, it's hurting his, his, his butthole and I keep fucking with him. And, uh, you know, so I know they're writing about my content's violent and this and that. But, and it's not because my message isn't wearing people like I killed shirts and selling them because he never even killed them. Or I'm not putting up a record when we were on Good Morning America or I forget what show we were on. I was on it. He was on it. They showcased the two of us. And he had shown a, a picture like he's Elvis Presley of a golden record of the, of the Castellano hit. You didn't kill him. You didn't shoot him. You waited two blocks away, supposedly. I don't even know if you're that close. Right. But, you know, this is all he has in life because he doesn't have a life. Yeah. So, you know, when people are, um, you know, impressed by what? What are you impressed with? The guy snaked everybody in his life. So, you know, what are you, what are you really impressed with? This ain't somebody to be impressed with. And he's a, he's a clown. He ain't going to yeah. do nothing on his own. You know what it sounds like to me? Um, it, it's a... Uh... It's just it's 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 the it's the life that you guys were in, right? Like like for example, my main job is I'm a sewer worker, okay? And there are times I'm at the bottom of the sewer and I'm literally shoveling shit, right? And I'm I'm getting my hands dirty. And then there is three uh bosses above me at the top telling me what I need to do and what I should do. And I'm, and it's like, dude, I'm the one down here. <coughs> shoveling the shit so the sewer could work better and you want to go shut the fuck up you 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 got this job because you passed the test you you were never down here right and it seems like that's the same kind of thing except that it's like you made it somewhere because of other reasons and i'm i'm the guy in the street putting it all together so don't tell me what it's like well it's like general millie i don't know if you know who that is that when they left Afghanistan and the 13 gold soldiers died and they disrespected him, they left all the equipment in Afghanistan, billions mm. of equipment. This guy's just a pencil pusher that became a general. He, he you know, no one's gonna respect him. He's a fucking no good bastard that left Americans. He, he was on Congress floor. He said he didn't know how many Americans he left. He didn't know how many Afghan allies that helped us there that we left that got killed. He didn't know shit. And, he, you know, he's, He's just a, a, a political figure that no one's going to respect. But if you get somebody that seen action, was on the front line and became a general, yeah, you're going to respect them. Right, so when, right, right, right. Uh, none of these guys are going to make me respect them. I got no respect for guys like Sam. You know, in our life, if you were a guy that was a worker or known to be dangerous and did things, listen, Johnny Koenig, I talk about him all the time because he was – a legitimate gangster, tough guy, did all kinds of time in jail. He was a nice guy. He was a funny guy. Now, I'm not saying people are going to like that he was in that life. And I'm not advocating people to be in that life. But if you're in that life, you got to take a guy like him that was really a guy that was out there doing work, not talking like Sammy, not talking bullshit. You know, he was the guy. Sammy's just a fucking bureaucratic bullshit that got lucky because Frankie DeChico died and a and car got blown up. So he's lucky because his best friend. And while we're on that subject, when his best friend got blown up, he did zero about it. Nothing. So it'll tell you about the tough guy that he is. He did zero. So Yeah, that's a good yeah. point. But I don't think anybody wanted to go to the war with the chin in his defense. <laughs> you don't gotta go to you know, the thing is it's it's not about it's either you're about it, you're the underboss in that family, and seven or eight of our guys were clipped. Eddie Lino, Bobby Morello, uh, Little Anthony, Greg Ryder. The different guys in our family were killed by other families, and nothing, nothing was done. Wow. So okay. when oh. you know when you when they're clipping through our guys one after another because of the Castellano hit, and you sat on your two hands, don't tell me you're a tough guy because mm. you didn't do shit. You had plenty okay. of time to, re- and he didn't even have to do it himself, and he didn't want to do it. You know why he didn't want to do it? Just what you just said, exactly. And you're right; they didn't want to go to war. He didn't want to go to war. He didn't want to get killed because he knew he was going to be on the hit parade next if he hit back. Right. So, you know, instead he kissed ass and he ran just like he's doing now. Wow. So, you know, the difference is he can't sit here 
and tell me if he needs to hire somebody like me to go do something to me if he had a problem. He ain't doing it. Right. You know, so right. why would I worry about this clown? You right. know, right. so, you know, and we're not out in the street like we were if we were. <laughs> I won't say what I would tell, but we were. <laughs> it's all right. I get it. I get yeah. it. So not just to change gears a little bit, but actually I'm on the same, it's on the same path. Joey Molino w- was on Vlad TV. You know, I want to talk about Joey Molino because he's all over social media now too, but he actually mentioned a 16 year old kid that Sammy had killed or had killed. And he said, yeah, he said, I don't know if you watched the interview, but he said, um, but Sammy don't, won't talk about that. He won't talk about the 16 year old. He, he got killed. Kaiser, it's, his name's Kaiser. And, and, uh, he, and, you know, as far as Joey, these guys all talk about Joey, right? But, First of all, Sammy doesn't even know Joe. And Sammy acts like he was good friends with his father. He's a fucking liar. And Joey's not stupid. So, you know, people ask me, like, listen, I just try to be honest about guys. You know, it, you know. so when he's talking about Sammy, he knows Sammy's full of shit. Joey's a smart guy in the street. He's not a dummy. He knows what he is. You know, he knows exactly what Sammy is. So, you know, when Sammy's trying to, you know, he, first off, Sammy, the way he talks, tries to act like he's above him. You know, mm-hmm. you're hiding in a sewer somewhere in Arizona and you're trying to act like you're above Joey. Just, and it's hard for me to explain how it's the way they word things, the way they say things, the way it's these little things that they say that an average person that's not from our life won't understand. Mm-hmm. So, you know, but so. Well, what was the story about this kid that uh, supposedly he was innocent? I don't know the, the story. He witnessed the murder. He was just a kid that witnessed the murder. That was it. He had nothing to do with the street. He was just a regular kid walking home, witnessed the murder, and Sammy killed him. And then wow. later on, he, bl- he blamed it on whoever it was with he was with at the time. But this is Sammy. You know, this doesn't, doesn't surprise me. And he didn't want to say he was sorry ever to, to the kid's family. And he says, and now, you know, he's, he sits there and he tries to bullshit his way around it, you know, years later because he got called out on it, not because he wanted to, you know. Oh, I take full responsibility. Yeah, okay. If you got caught, but you don't take responsibility for killing them. And right, you and right, you, right. you keep talking about glorifying mm-hmm. wearing t-shirts of people that were dead in this life. Yeah, that's that's in bad taste. Yeah, that's it's, it's in terrible taste. But he doesn't have anything else. What <laughs> what does he got to talk about? No, you know, you happen to be I had the, I had this discussion with, with my brother, my oldest brother. Uh, and um you know, there are there are guys that are in the social media in the mob genre that are really making uh, great strides. Like, uh, you know, Michael Franchese, he's smart enough that he's able to interview people and have people from the head, you know, he had uh, Jordan Peterson on, who's like a tremendous psychologist. And he's, he's, you know, he's had, I believe he had Mike Tyson on, right? And, you know, Sammy really can't do that, right? He doesn't have the intellect to do that. And you, you now have uh, the John and Gene show and you do interviews and you don't necessarily have to talk about this mob thing even though uh, everybody loves to hear it, but you can go into different avenues. And uh, another guy I always bring up to is Larry Mazza. He, he's not really much at the social media, but he owns, I think he owns two gyms in Florida and he's a consultant and he's, he's well, got- Larry's, a- inte- Larry's intelligent. Michael, yeah. he's very intelligent. They articulate yeah. And, you know, just so you know, I've had all kinds of, I have all kinds of people on my show. I have right. religious people. I had the psychiatrists on my show. I've had- you know, advocates from prison on my show. I have attorneys on my show over the years. And I've talked about politics. I, I diversify off this mob genre. I don't just talk about the mob genre. Right. I talk about Epstein. I've talked about different subjects. Yeah. Uh, UFOs. I, I can't ima- even remember all the subjects I, I've spoken about. And then you, yeah. have guy, then you have guys that are just kind of thugs, like a Sammy, if you will, or I can't think of anybody else. Uh, or maybe just, you know, just phonies, just frauds. And they don't have the intellect to do things like that. You know, they can't. They're stuck in this one genre. And it's getting to the point where Sammy tells stories and he's kind of just telling the same story over again. You know, when he when his channel first blew up, everybody was tuning in. But it's kind of like he's kind of telling the same stories only from different perspectives at this point. You know, it's kind of getting boring. He doesn't and, have more he can really say, to be honest with you, in the genre. Mm-hmm. It's crazy for me to say it because people go, oh, what are you talking about? He's on the boss. He wasn't involved like people think he was involved. But he's good at bullshitting people. Mm-hmm. You know, he didn't, like I said, he you know, even during the Castellano hit, he was just straightened out. He he wasn't, you know, nothing at that time. It's not like John, he was, you know, John liked him. It's not true. You know, and, and people really don't don't understand this part of it. 
You know, so he's getting away with it because people, no one's checking him. Really, no. Well, there's a couple of guys that checked him actually. Mikey saw started abusing him a lot, and you know because Mikey had knowledge. So you know, and Mikey doesn't come off to act like he's a tough guy and a killer. So yeah, I can give guys credit when they don't come off and try to pretend they're killers because Sammy's coming off like he's this tough guy killer. He's not. Gotcha. You know, right. and, and he comes off like he's this big earner. He wasn't this big earner either. His 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 uh, brother in law is the one that got him in in this industry. That's where he made his money from Garofalo. You know, he didn't even make money in construction prior to that. Garofalo brought him into this thing. Mm-hmm. You know, Sammy was good at one thing: snaking anybody that helped him. You know, so you, you, every one of his friends he fucked over. That's that's Sammy. That's right. it. So you know, when you talk about articulate, he can't articulate. He's a dumb. Mm-hmm. And he right. reads off the prompter, you know, and that's true. I mean, honestly, he reads off. Oh, the really? Does he? Yeah, he does. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay, I did not know that. All right. So he, his production is done by a couple of people. They do it well, whoever works for him, and he does it off a prompter, and they study, and he reads, and he can't go interview with anybody. Sit down. He's a fucking clown. I yeah, mean, yeah. really, you know, you just can sit in and look at him the way he carries himself. He's like a two bit bum, you know. So you know, there's there's a difference between guys like you just said. You know, Larry was very educated. Michael's educated. They articulate right. well. You know, they can fit in anywhere. You can bring them to a you know a lawyer's meeting. You can bring them to a ball game, and you know, with different type of people, and they always mix in. They'll mesh, but you know, he can't. You know, right, so. right, right, right. Let's talk about for uh, last question on the the mob topic. Joey Molino is all over social media, and people have different perspectives and opinions of him that he's still uh, involved in the life, but. You know, certain people believe that he shouldn't be on social media. What is what's your perspective on on Joey Molino and his, his my perspective his... is the mob has, has it's nowhere near what it used to be, first off. Second, mm-hmm. if they're gonna follow rules, then follow their own rules. For every guy they brought around that's a rat, go kill him. That's their rules. For every guy that brought somebody around that did something wrong, go take care of it. For every mob guy that slapped another mob guy, go take care of it. For every guy that's not a mob guy. They put their hands on on a made guy. Go take care of that. Go take care of the guys who are all allocuting to to positions in the mob. Take care of uh, all the bosses all around in every state that that's been talking and wearing wires. And they have no right to tell Joey to do anything. I I was very open about this. I said Joey, whether he's active or not active, I don't care what he's doing. To be honest with you, but yeah. I know that he has the right to do whatever he is doing, whether he's active or not active. Because there's nobody to tell him what to do. I don't see them doing anything for him. When they were ratting on him and he went to prison, I didn't see anybody killing anybody from him outside his crew of guys. I said I didn't see anybody kill any of them, any of these other guys that were ratting, uh, whether it was the Philly mob guys or it was the New York mob guys or any of these guys that were you know bringing in drugs and selling drugs. And you know I can tell you, they break every rule. You're not supposed to sell drugs; they sell drugs. They're not supposed to do drugs; they're all doing drugs. I don't know where to stop. There's guys that got, you know, I just talked about it. it was a guy that, you know, was talking about a murder, got his friend locked up, uh, and he's doing 20 something years, bro. They're supposed to kill that guy. You want to go by rules? I, I can teach them more rules than they, all these guys know. Right. These guys don't follow one fucking rule. So why the hell should he listen to anybody about any rule anywhere? I says, until they follow their own rules. And they start at the top. So when Vinny Gorgeous went to jail because Joe Messina wore a wire, he was living in Florida openly. He 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 didn't live in uh, out of, out of space. Why did you go do something? You just want to be gangsters. Well, you know the guy that's selling drugs and he got caught. Why don't you do something? Well, the guy that's taking a plea and he's not allowed to because the drug guys. Why don't you do something? This you know how many guys I'm going to start exposing the guys. I just said this. I wasn't going to do it, but now I'm going to do it. I think in four or five shows. There's three guys right now off the top of my head that got straightened out, and one's getting straightened out or real straightened out that are rats. And not me just saying it. I can prove it. Wow. So they're informants and they're rats. One guy in open court went into open court openly in family court and made crazy statements for over an hour himself. So what's the point? Like, what's the point of this, of of the mafia? If there is no mafia. uh, Yeah. Yeah. The point is a joke because anybody that was really true, tough guy or wise guy or gangster that was in jail years ago, they know that it's over. I don't know right. what they, if you're a boss, right? And you got to give an order to somebody, you're going to trust them. And if you're the guy taking the order, you're going to go do a piece of work. Knowing all the bosses are wearing wires and fucking ratting in every crew. 
Mm-hmm. It's not like I'm saying, you know, it's not the underlings only. It's all the bosses are at. You know, guys like Al Diarco, uh, Lucchese family, he's a rat. I just, I didn't see anybody kill him. He took all kinds of money. Uh, you know, Leonetti and the Philadelphia mob. Well, I don't care what their reasons are. They ratted. The whole Bonanno family ratted at one time. Yeah, the, right. the Colombo family got this member after the 90s war. They were all ratted. That's they right. got taken. So that's three families that were down and ratted. The whole Gambino family, how many guys ratted? All the bosses. So what are, what are we talking about when someone acts like, Am I saying something that's not accurate? Of course it's accurate. Forget right. about the laws and the rules. So why should Joey listen to any of these guys? If right. I was Joey, I would say I would I don't I don't watch honestly, I don't even watch my own podcast. So I didn't watch his podcast. I know guys tell me what was said and different things. And you know, I agree with them. He says, but he should have said this on his on the show if he didn't. I don't know if he did on on Vlad. He should say, listen, uh I'm you know, he's never gonna say he's in the life for isn't. He said, I'm not in the life, but if I was. I would say follow every rule. If we don't live by all these rules, I name them. Name, I can name 20 off the top of my head, like I just named about 10 of rules that aren't followed. So if they're not followed, when they follow those rules, then I'll follow this rule, and I won't do social media. But until somebody else has put money in his pocket, and for whatever other reason he's doing it, who cares? And everybody tells me, what do you think? I'm just like, you did this. Just listen. Just like I say, if somebody says something against me, like Sammy does, then I'll, then I'll talk. I says, otherwise, I don't hate on nobody. I got no reason. I actually stuck up for the guy. I says, because what I know in his history, I respect him. Mm-hmm. You know, Sammy can say what the fuck he wants. Uh, you didn't go to trial like this guy did. I says, he went to trial. Like him or not, he went to trial all over the place and beat his cases. And, you know, there's people who talk against him about his uncle. And, you know, Gene had a lot of things to say. And I went against Gene. People might think it was just for the show. What really was it? You know, I was being honest, and Gene felt the way he did. Gene obviously liked Sammy because he went on his show. I think Sammy's a jerk off, and I told Gene, I don't know what you're going on this idiot show. He's a jerk off. He's a rat. He's what he is. And you know, well, it's, it's a to, it's a YouTube thing, right? I mean, it's a social media thing. If you kind of well, have to... I, you know, my, you know, and, and I'm always going to have my opinion. You know, I don't consider myself a Sammy. I I didn't rat. I stood in the penitentiaries where they were all giving me up. So you got to either say to yourself. I'm a sucker or, or I'm going to say, you know, fuck this life. Now, right. I'm not talking about my cousins ratted on me, but that didn't make me roll. What made me later on flip was all the bosses were giving me up uh, on two different crews. And the third family wouldn't help me, and I asked them for help. And, you know, Genevieve's family, I had no involvement with. So, you know, I didn't ask them for anything. Mm-hmm. And the Colombo family was gone already. Yeah, so I'm yeah. saying, you know, who am I protecting? The guys that are all fucking shitting on me? Right, the guys right, that are closing right. it up to the FBI. There's no, listen, in our rules, there's no excuse. You're not allowed to talk to the FBI. You can't meet them. You can't sit down with them. You can't have lunch with them. So when these guys are all making excuses, that's for the suckers and the, the citizens in the, in the world. They don't know any better. But we mm. know our rules. Those are death sentences. Okay. So there is no excuse for anything. You, you talk, you met them, you're done. All right. I want to I touch on uh, one other topic because you know, I don't want to keep it any longer. It's already been over an hour, but uh, uh, this is completely off the mob genre. It's just uh, something that's important to you, and I think it, we should talk about it. Um, a few years ago, or t- I think it was two years ago, um, you lost uh, your daughter to uh, fentanyl. And, two years ago, August 18th, it'll be two years. Okay, right. And um, obviously, you know, without having to say so, it, it, it hurt you tremendously. But what is it about this uh, fentanyl that it's 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 laced with heroin? It's laced with cocaine. Um, <clears throat> I interviewed one girl who was a prostitute that takes it directly. Um, it's coming in through Mexico from China, supposedly. What's your take on it? How is it going to get under control? Because even me, my niece, her 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 boyfriend also overdosed and died on fentanyl. Uh, it was laced with heroin. It was, it was, and it's like, it seems to be completely out of control. It's out of control because we got a piece of shit president, right? And, and I got no qualm saying he's a piece of shit. And anybody would have a brain, because if I ask them questions and they tell me they, they're a, a, a complete left, it's very simple. We could start at the border. It's a $35 billion industry for China. They don't call it a controlled substance. It's made in 168 chemical labs. They can stop 
100 to 120 of those labs immediately if they call it controlled substance. This president here, if he wanted to stop it, he could because he left these open borders. And for the people who don't understand why he left these open borders, it's $500 billion he gave to illegal immigrants coming to this country. Some of them are terrorists. A handful of them are bringing in the fentanyl. Some of them are prostituting kids, child trafficking. That's but the reason that's... why they're doing it is so the people don't understand it, for his electoral votes. So if in California you have about 400,000 people left, they lose electoral votes in their state. But if you if you fill it back up with these illegal immigrants, now you got those electoral votes again. So that's one of the reasons they bring them in. When they tell you they care about the inner city, they don't give a fuck about any of these black kids from my neighborhood. Yeah. And when they keep conning them, the only reason why you see these major cases like Daniel Penny, when he choked out the homeless guy that was, he had 36 offenses on the train and he killed him. That's right. They don't give a fuck. They just want the black community to believe because they're major cases that they care about them because they want their vote. But if they really cared about them, they wouldn't give $500 billion to illegal immigrants that's coming out of those same inner city kids' families that are going to work making three, four, six hundred dollars a week suffering. And it comes out of their taxes to give to illegal immigrants. They give them school choice. They won't, but they'll give them to illegal immigrants. They'll give them no health care, but they'll give it to illegal immigrants. I could go on and on. They yeah. took their jobs and they don't give it to either. They don't they don't give it to the inner city. So I am from the inner city. So I speak up for them. It's just the thing is a lot of them are starting to wake up now that they've been calling their whole lives. Even as even with these criminal things that they're doing, they're just trying to win the next election and they're going to promise them things for the next six months. Act like they care about them, and they're going to continue to fuck them like they've been doing. So you know, and this president with fentanyl knows there's a hundred to two hundred thousand kids a year that are dying because wow. it's hundred times stronger than, than heroin, fifty times stronger than morphine, and a kid gets high on cocaine, everybody parties. Whether it's our culture or other countries, they smoke a little weed. They're not supposed to die, they're dying. They take a fat bearing pill, they're dying. They take a, a, a pill for uh, Adderall for school to study, they're dying. It ain't just about getting high. They take a Percocet like my daughter did at 10 in the morning, they're dying. That's wow. not a junkie. That's not somebody that's snorting coke and shooting heroin and AOD. That's a big difference. These kids are being murdered. So yeah, I, I you know, I don't nonstop because it's my baby I lost. And you know, when people talk about Somebody getting high and they're doing a pill here or there. So what? Our whole lives, everybody's done them. They didn't die. So, you know, one of the senators were talking about if a plane went down every day with 300 passengers, you'd see how fast it was all over the place. For some reason, because it's not a plane and they're dying this way, I want to understand the reasoning. Why are they sending $110 billion they just released to Iran, but they're not fighting fentanyl? They're not fighting for security for kids in school. They're not fighting for the inner city, like I said, for their for their health benefits, for single moms, for therapy, for rehabilitation. This is this is, I'm sick of hearing, you know, because being from the street, I know a con when I see it. Mm -hmm. You know, regular people are too stupid. So if you ask to go back uh, backtrack a little, if you ask somebody on the left, are you better off now? On the, forget about Trump and Biden, right? Who you like, who you don't like. I'm not asking that. Were you better off, though, when Trump was in? Was food less money? Or is it not less money now? Was gas prices less money? Or is it less money now? Is your electric bill and gas bill and oil bill more now or less now? Was inflation higher then or now? Was the interest rates higher then or now? Was job security higher then or now? It's it's hands down towards Trump. I don't care if you hate his guts. That's right. As a I agree. person, as a citizen, we were better off with him. And he is the most important thing. There wasn't a fucking war anywhere. That's right. There was wars all over the place. I don't know what everybody's thinking. Are they waiting for World War III? They're instigating Putin. You got France now threatening Putin. If, if Trump was here, this would have never got to this extent. We got to worry about China going into Taiwan. We got to worry about France elevating Putin. We got uh, uh, trying to think what country, Slavic, one of the countries, just the prime minister, a woman. Just threatened to bring troops in against who? No one's talking about peace in Ukraine. Biden's now just talking against not uh, against uh, uh, the prime minister in in uh, Israel because he wants the votes. He could give a fuck about Palestine or anybody else. 
Mm-hmm. This is just about votes. I don't know how people don't see what's going on and it just threw the Jews on the bus. Yeah, I agree 110%. I mean, like you said, it's undeniable at this point. And there's, there's plenty of other uh, reasons, uh, like you said, even that affect us on a, on a small level and it affect us on a global level. But um, <clears throat> so now you have the John and Gene show. Uh, just to wrap up, why don't you tell us what you have planned for the future or the show, or so on and so forth. And how did you hook up with Gene? Gene and I know his family since I'm a kid. I, me and his aunt were friends since we're young. Uh, we were the same age. So she hung around all of us small guys since he was young. Uh, Gene's uncles and everybody I know since forever. So I hooked up with Gene back then and he went to jail and we just got back together again. And I'm always keeping it moving. I got a, a movie I'm doing, Pony. I'm starring in it and it's about dirt car racing and fentanyl. And the reason I got involved is because of my daughter with fentanyl, um, which I'm never going to stop talking about that. And people ask me why I dislike this president so much. And obviously I lost my daughter because of this president mm-hmm. and what they're doing. So um, to me, he's just corrupt. The constitution that he swore to is to protect this country and the citizens of this country. And he doesn't do it. He protects. He'd be a great president right now for Venezuela, China, Mexico, <laughs> and uh, you know all these other and, and uh, Iran, but not for the United States. So, so anybody I, that I, says that is crazy. I'm going to interrupt one second. Your your daughter took a took a painkiller, and that's how she her over- birth. It was really? her birthday, August 14th. I talked to her for her birthday. Said happy birthday. Talked all night. She went to bed. She was coming home the next day. She lived with me. August 15th, she got up at 9 o'clock in the morning. My grandson was still sleeping. So she made a couple of text uh, things to her girlfriends, said she was coming back home, waiting for a plane. Got, she had to be at the airport at 4 o'clock. And she said, I'm going to take a, a pill and go lay down again with the baby. She took a pill to lay down. It was one pill. Uh, Percocet had fentanyl in it, lace. She didn't know what was in it. And I uh, kept her on life support till August 18th. Uh, one of my best wow. friends is a neurosurgeon. And uh, basically from the first day, I knew I didn't have much hope from him. I didn't want to hear it, but and uh, just ruined my world after that. So, yeah, that is just that's just tragic. Like you said, you know, if somebody is partying and doing all these crazy drugs and you know, coke and heroin or meth and it's laced. But if somebody's taking a painkiller because whatever, because they they're in pain or because they need to get some sleep. And and they overdose like that. That's just like you said. That's just pure murder. But this that, guy doesn't care. This this whole government doesn't care. I don't know how many more kids got to die every day. But you'll send 110 billion dollars to Iran. That's killing the kids on the street that want freedom. So right. they're killing those Muslim kids on the street. No one's talking about those Muslims, right? Because they're getting butchered over in Iran. But he's giving 110 billion dollars, and then he's and then he's funding wars all over the place in Ukraine. Not talking about peace with anybody. Not talking about peace for the kids that are getting killed in Palestine. You know, he's not talking about nothing like this about anybody. But everybody votes for this guy. At least Trump, there was no wars. That's whether right. You're, you're for Palestine, whether you're for Israel, there was no war. There was no, you know, there was no conflicts going on. So how is anybody justifying the, all these wars all over the place? The border, 10 million, 12 million people came to this country. And wait, we're going to have a terrorist attack. That's happening. Not yeah, well, yeah. Yeah. That's not a maybe. That's going to be a hundred percent. That's happening. It's you know how it, you know how I look at uh, Trump and why you would take him so serious. I don't know if you ever saw the footage of when he went to North Korea without without Secret Service. He just went on his yeah. own. Yeah. Did you ever did you ever walk into a place where you had you were by yourself when at your height, right? When you were on the street at your height, did you ever walk into a place where you knew there was an enemy or somebody you had a problem with and you walked in by yourself and everybody took you serious because they knew you were a very serious guy? Yeah. It, I've done, you know, I, done, I, done, I, done, and I look back and I go, I don't know what the fuck I was thinking. Like yeah. you got more lives, but you do it. And do I, it I, I feel like that would, that's Trump. Trump, they know he's a serious dude. They know you really shouldn't fuck with this guy. So he just walks on into North Korea with no secret service by himself, knowing you're not going to touch me. You can't Well, look what me. they're doing to him now with all these, these crazy cases. This is insane. This only goes on at third world republics. I mean, it's yeah, just, yeah, yeah. It's how do crazy. they think this is okay? What's going on in, in, in Georgia with that Fannie Willis? I mean, she's a joke. 
Yeah, she, it's, she it's pretty bad. She has third grade education. Forget about a, a prosecutor. Yeah. She, I mean, she, I don't care. You know, people say, well, they're all scared to talk because she's black. I don't give a fuck what color she is. I just talk straight. I mean, the, the girl's an imbecile. I mean, so yeah. is the guy. So is the judge. I mean, so is this white judge over here, Engron, with the uh, other case for 400, they, they charge him 450 million, whatever. This is a joke. This is communism. I don't know how people can be okay with this. Whatever side you're, you're on, how, you can't be okay with this. This is the end of our constitution. It's not, it's not okay. You know, the White House wrote about me. I don't know, you know if you knew that. They called no. me and they wrote about me because I was with Trump. And I'm like, I'm not a gangster anymore. That was 20 years ago. I says, right. why shouldn't I be with him? Why right. shouldn't I be in pictures with him? What, what, what the hell? I'm, I'm a public figure. I do TV. I do movies. I do shows. I do talks. I do lectures. You know, I do lectures at police academies. I do lectures all over the place. So why shouldn't I be with him? I mean, I don't get it. I'm not, you know, what do you want me to do? You know, I changed my life a long time ago. So when they say yeah. these things, it's just not, a, they're not trying to attack me. They're trying to attack him. Right, right, exactly. One more question, and I'm going to let you go because it's been a fantastic interview. Mike Tyson or Jake Paul? Jake Paul better t- take out all insurance he can. I <laughs> Listen, I actually don't hate on the guy, but they got to understand. You know, years ago they talk about Slice. You remember uh, uh, Kimbo Slice? They were sure. talking about, I was in prison. Guys were arguing. I go, you guys, you guys are amateurs. You have no clue what you're talking about, how great this guy is. I go, he could be the worst fighter in the world at his age against a pro now because he's an older guy. Right. I go, but when you're talking about fighting guys like this, he hits him with a body punch. He'll fucking put him, break his will, put him to sleep. Yeah. I says, you don't got to go to the head. I says, you know, these guys really just don't get it. I says, you know, it's just it's night and day. Guy can look good against an amateur. But when you get in with somebody like him, come on. And, and, and I like Jake Paul, what he's done with himself. He's smart, smart businessman. Oh, but, absolutely. You know, unless he made a deal with Tyson and he's going to really hold back and he's just going to make money. Uh, he's out of his fucking mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah. At first, they were talking about an exhibition, but I understand they're really trying to get it sanctioned for an actual fight. Well, they get it sanctioned. He better get some good insurance. Yeah, yeah really tell me about. It. Yeah, yeah. He's, 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 you know, another league. He's in. John, so, it's uh, it's always a pleasure. Uh, yeah. much respect, much love to you. Always, I, I still am grateful for you letting me come on your your old show with Michael. I wish you nothing but the best, man. And we will definitely be in touch. Thank you for thanks, doing this. Thanks, John. I appreciate it. Man. Good luck, and I'll see you soon. Definitely. Have a good night, bro. Okay, you too, brother. See you.